Well, in more concerning news for Victoria, health authorities are scrambling to contain a coronavirus outbreak just on the cusp of getting out of lockdown in Melbourne's northern suburbs. The virus has hit two schools and spreading into a social housing tower. Ultimately, uh, someone who should not have been at school went to school. The notion of going back and providing the same message nine times does get a little bit difficult. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily conceding that point on the specifics. More broadly, though, uh, we're going to extraordinary lengths to make sure people know and understand what they have to do. The Year 5 student tested positive as part of the cluster after attending school for two days when they should have been home isolating due to a close contact infection. 73 close contacts of the student's family, they've now been identified and 400 people connected to the school are tonight in isolation. Epidemiologist and infectious diseases expert at the University of New South Wales, Professor Raina McIntyre, joins me now from Sydney. Thank you for, for your time, Raina. You know, Victorians are just about out of lockdown and if there's fears, you know, that they're back to the start tonight. 120 people in a public housing tower. Now they're isolating. We've got other concerns with this cluster. How concerned would you be? It is a concern when it's high-density living, uh, one of the housing towers uh, where people are living in more crowded conditions than normal, um, probably extended families as well. So, um, you know, it's good to hear that, that they're throwing extra resources at trying to um, manage this and make sure it doesn't get out of hand. I was just going to ask you, why are the public housing towers so vulnerable when you think that, you know, a lot of people live in apartment blocks? Why are the towers different than just a general apartment block? Well, any, any um, apartment block is at risk. And during the original SARS outbreak, there was an outbreak in an apartment block in Hong Kong called the Amoy Gardens, where it's basically spread from floor to floor through the bathroom pipes, through the sewage, um, because there was a faulty design in the in the S-bend of the plumbing. So when you pull the flush, you know, the virus is in the feces. So if somebody's infected and you flush the toilet, it goes up the pipes. And in that case, it infected people on multiple floors of the building and in adjacent buildings. Now, there has been an outbreak similar to that in China, described with COVID-19, where um, it spread from the 15th floor to the 26th and 27th floor of a building and an apartment building. So that's the real concern is the sewage. Um, and um, hopefully the design of the plumbing is doesn't have that mm. problem. But, you know, um, I don't know how old the buildings are or, um, you know, what the ventilation is like. But the other issue is people living together in very crowded conditions. So if there's extended families, large groups of people living together, then that mm. just increases the risk of transmission. I mean, a real focus in all of this has been contact tracing. We had the PM say at the start of the week that he thinks Victoria's contact tracing is still subpar compared to New South Wales. Uh, Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt was out. Let's have a listen. We're now in a position that we can progressively, safely uh, reopen Victoria on the same basis as New South Wales. Is he right? Well, contact tracing is the key. Um, the two things that are most critical to containing an outbreak are finding all the cases and then tracking all their contacts and putting them in quarantine for two weeks, which is the incubation period. And the contact tracing actually is really resource intensive because for every case you find, there might be 10 to 25 contacts. So, for example, in Victoria, when there were 500 cases a day, they would have been having to trace 5,000 to, you know, um, you know, 20,000 um, contacts potentially. And at any one time, there might have been 200,000 contacts or so um, to monitor. So not only do they have to be tracked, but they've got to be monitored every day for 14 days. And it's got yeah, to be Victoria, done Victoria, within... just let me jump in there, Professor. Victoria has had months and months and months to get its act together. I think people at home would be looking at this tonight saying, why on earth hasn't it been fixed? Well, I don't know what the resource situation is. Um, I would really hope, I know they've been recruiting people and training people, um, but I don't know how it stacks up compared to New South Wales now. Um, 
but that's a really important part of the response is making sure we have adequate human resources um, and personnel. You know, you can use digital contact tracing as well. Even in Wuhan, mm -hmm. they realised pretty quickly they couldn't keep up with the contact tracing and they switched to digital contact tracing. A lot of Asian countries have used it really uh, successfully and when you're having high numbers of cases, actually it makes it a lot easier because manual contact tracing, um, you won't be able to do it no matter how well resourced the health system if the epidemic gets too big. Um, the problem is the privacy issue in Western countries. Well, I think we're beyond that now in Victoria. Professor Raina McIntyre, thank you as always. It's a pleasure, Peter. Right.